So we'll be going to Diafa. We're going to be checking out Chef Reem, the Syrian Palestinian chef, cooking up flavors of the Middle East. Gonna make some flatbread, eat some hummus, some chicken confit. All those spices are making my heart sing. I'm ready for this one. Let's go. This is food from the Levantine part of the Arab world. Okay. And we're gonna be making a feast of amazing spreads and spreads, as right. I call them. So the name of this restaurant is called Diafa, yeah. which is essentially Arabic for hospitality. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I'm a child of immigrants, so sometimes you feel like you're a stranger in a strange land. Uh -huh. You're like neither here nor there. Right, right, right. People are not gonna ever get the chance to visit um, Damascus or Beirut. So I'm creating a piece of home, a piece of my homeland right here in Oakland. So we're making a Palestinian chicken dish called moussakhan. If you ask any Palestinian what's the national dish, right. they would say moussakhan. We don't have a state, but we have a national dish. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's how it goes. This dish is traditionally big roasted chicken in a spice called sumac. It's supposed to be eaten communally. So we're gonna do a version of what we, how we sell it here at the restaurant. All right. Um, and we're gonna start with the onion. Okay. How many pounds of this usually? We go through like 100 pounds a day. <laughs> Maybe, can you cry, Sheldon? You are! <laughs> What's cool about Palestinians is because we're a refugee population. Wherever we go, we sort of adapt to where we are. Okay. So my earliest memories of Musakhan is actually in a burrito form with tortilla. <laughs> my mom used to make it and wrap it in a burrito, and then we would take them to school as a sandwich. All right. After all our tears. After all our tears. Throw the semek in now. Sumek is essentially a berry. It's a good tenderizer. It's used to marinate a lot of meat, particularly the, in Arab and Persian cuisine. Mm -hmm. But it's not to be confused with the sumek in the US, which is poisonous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we use the chicken legs, because the chicken legs are the best. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> these have been cured for the last two days. So now we're going to take some of these onions, okay. and we're going to start to layer them. More salt. More sumac. Then we're gonna do a spice mix called baharat. It's a seven spice mix, mostly allspice, but there's cinnamon, nutmeg, a little bit of cumin, cardamom, black pepper, and coriander. This is olive oil from previous batches of the confit. Yeah, uh, you know, with e each time it gets richer and richer. It picks up the flavor from the previous batch. Yeah. This is amazing. Bringing the voice of my Arab heritage feels very important. I don't know how many times when I started Reams, an elder would come into my bakery and pull me aside and say, thank you for doing this. Like people didn't know what Palestinian food was. You started as a bakery first before a restaurant. Yeah, so I'm a baker. I got into the food world actually as a community organizer. So I was organizing workers for their rights and I went on a soul-searching trip with my father to Syria and Lebanon. And it was there I discovered the Arab street corner bakeries nice. and the role that they were playing in these communities. Cause you know, I mean, you hear about the Middle East on the news and all you hear about is like, Auto, yeah. yeah, the violence and the war it's and it's so and sad. But when you go to those bakeries, you don't even know that that's happening outside those doors. Those bakeries serve as an anchor. Yeah. And yeah. I wanted to create that here. Fresh baked bread, I mean, there's nothing like it, right? Like that hospitality component carries through Diafa. So yeah, if you were to think about Reams and Diafa, Reams is essentially the heartbeat. Okay. And Diafa is like the arteries. Back in the day, when the grandmas did this, they used cushions to shape their bread, but they would basically stretch their dough on cushions. On cushions, like that. You get this at the local Ikea? Yeah. <laughs> Amazon, <laughs> you know. This is the, the new school, old school. There you go. Instantly bubbles up. The word for this bread is called markuk. Markuk. Which means thin. Okay. Everything is very literal in Arabic. It's like <laughs> usually the Arabic <laughs> word is used to describe the texture or the shape of something. This is going to be the base of our chicken. This is the staple. It's called zatar. It's a dried wild thyme with sumac berry and sesame seed. Nice. All right. We're a gluten-positive space here. 
There's a tartness to it that, that I wasn't expecting it to yeah. have that crispy, chewy. This is what my mom used to make us drive 20 minutes <laughs> for to the Armenian bakeries that used to make this. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand why would we drive all that way. And later in life, I discovered it's like my parents were searching for home. This bread embodies that. Home is a, an elusive thing now. Whether you're a new immigrant who came here or a refugee who were forced from your homeland or a black resident who's lived here for ages and seeing their neighborhoods change mm -hmm. around them, that concept of home is fleeting. And so what I really want to do is try to create that, that sense of belonging. That's the virtue of Arabs. Yeah. That's the hospitality we bring. So I want to be able to bring that to the forefront. This is a typical Arabic spread that we uh -huh. call meze. The root of it comes from like to savor slowly. So it's really shared small plates. Okay. Bread is your tool. As they say, some people we use forks and knives and spoons. We use our bread in our hands. Uh -huh. Dip into, do the hummus first. This is a spiced lamb. Yeah. The spices are like what you say, you don't hold back over here. We don't hold back. I love that. Okay. So this is the dish that we worked on. Tears of joy. To Tears start of joy. Off, lost our onion. <laughs> I remember eating this as a kid, and like oil dripping down oh, my forearms when I was eating the sandwich. Mm. The onion tart on the bottom. Uh, the onions that we made, we puree it with um, red wine vinegar. Um, some pomegranate, some black pepper, some salt. Kind of like our version of the adobo. Yeah, it does. It has that, yeah, that umami the and, the, and the tartness of yeah, it. Yeah, the sour. And I can see like the hospitality of it because you have to, whoever's around the table, oh, you yeah. have to be personal with it yeah. because you're, you're dipping. You're the literally same bowl. like eating with your hands and it's very communal. In Palestine, this dish is literally served in a large platter as big as this table with like <laughs> loads and loads of onion and chicken. And yeah. people just and go, at people go, go at yeah. it. And people go at it. Wow. So you guys made this in the market still. Tell me about those, those early days of, of slinging it like that. I was working as a baker and then I started experimenting at the places I was at. It turned into a series of pop-ups. They were just really successful and I found this program called La Cucina. They incubate women-owned businesses and they help me sort of figure out how to start my business from ground up. I mean, the baker is part of the family. In the Arab world, <laughs> people literally bring their dough to the oven no. for the baker to bake for them. So I wanted to be that. I yeah. wanted an extended family because I don't have a lot of family around right. here. When I opened up Tin Roof, I was like integrated into people's lives. Yeah. Right? That was so rewarding to me. You talked about your, your parents were, were refugees uh -huh. and you have a influence of the different flavors and you impart that into, into your food too. Mm -hmm. You know, when people say that's not traditional, that's not, you know, authentic, it's really authentic to me. This is like who I am. All these dishes in some way or form is a story about my upbringing. My grandma, she was amazing because she could remember all these recipes from back in Yaffa. Then those dishes <laughs> melded into the dishes in Gaza because that was right near the Mediterranean. Oh. Then they moved to Beirut. I think that's what's beautiful yeah. about food, that it's right. always evolving. I think that's when food is special when it comes from necessity and practicality like that. And for Palestinians, food is very political. Yeah. So when you take erase the name behind it, it's another way that you're erasing our culture. Like yeah. we're fighting to exist. And our food is a marker of our existence. My whole life kind of growing up in America, I was scared to say who I was. I was scared to say I was Palestinian. There was so much racism against Arabs. It was right around 9-11. My little kid self, who was like ashamed of my identity and scared, that's really depressing. But I feel like when I came out here, it's a place you can really express who you are. And I rediscovered food and my connection to my culture. And it was through cooking where I healed. I love that food is that eraser to to blur the lines a little bit. A little bit, and and not, and, you know, oh, yeah. food can be uncomfortable too, yeah. you know. I, I don't think it has to be all like <laughs> yeah. lovey-dovey. I think uh, the table is also a place to have the hard conversations. This restaurant is really my homage, not just to my culture as an Arab, but to my culture as an Oaklander. Like I want the city to develop, but I want it to develop for the people who live in it. 
Marinate this with a little bit of the achote, the natto seed, a little citrus, a little garlic.